Hello, my name is Jonathan Swift and welcome to this webinar, Locked Out in Lockdown. With the launch of Blueprint One last September, Lloyd's demonstrated its commitment to an ambitious program of modernization for the London market. But as research conducted by Post with WNS found shortly afterwards, opinion was split on the anticipated success of proposed reforms, with technology adoption and culture highlighted as key barriers to change. However, and by accident rather than designed, the mindset among those working in the Lloyd's and London market looks to have shifted. The onset of COVID-19 saw Lloyd's close the underwriting room on the 19th of March, now it's a necessity people had to adapt to a new working practices remotely. Today, during this webinar, brought to you by Insurance Post in association with WNS, we will ask an expert panel how the Lloyds and London market has responded to COVID-19 and what the lasting impact will be on EC3. With that, I'd like to welcome my panel. We have Hugo Baker, the Managing Director of Ulysses Re, Adrian Guthridge, the S Senior Vice President of Insurance at WNS Global Services, Paul Johnson, the CEO of Hyperion X, and Chris Moore, the head of iBot and Dexy Active Underwriter at Apollo Syndicate Management Limited. Welcome, gentlemen. Morning. Now I'm going to start. This is a this is a live interactive webinar, so we want you, the audience, to get involved. You can do this at any point during the proceedings by using the tab on your screen to ask a question. Um, please get your thinking caps on, ask your questions, and we will come to these later. So um, my first question, really, uh, I referred to COVID-19 and uh, in, in the earlier uh, opening here, but what has, how has COVID-19 helped speed up modernization in the Lloyd and London market? And I'll come to you first of all, Paul. Um, I think in a sense, uh, Jonathan, the remote the need to operate remotely um, has been the real obvious change in working practice whether or not that in itself has sped up the modernization of operational practices for Lloyd's I think is um, still a debatable question but clearly the fact that the industry has been able to adapt very quickly to remote working suggests that there is an appetite and an adaptability to be able to interact in a different way than perhaps uh, the market has operated in the past. So that should suggest that there should be an increased appetite for uh, further uh, acceleration of uh, technology and digital trading. I, I think the, the last point uh, for me on this question is you know, if you didn't have a digital strategy before, you absolutely need one now. Chris. Yeah, sure. I, I suppose I, I echo those comments. I think COVID has been the great accelerator that, in my opinion, frankly, we, we needed as an industry. Um, in particular, Lloyd's, who, who I think, you know, were open and knew that they needed to go through a transition or, or a modernization. But given we are an industry that is, that is grounded in tradition, we needed a catalyst for change and, and COVID can be that change. The, the future blueprint for Lloyd's was issued pre-COVID and their targets were already firmly in place, you know, encouraging electronic trading for the syndicates that are involved there. So. You know, I think we were moving in the right directions, but COVID has put that on a, on, a, on, a, on a vast accelerator and it's forced everyone to embrace that change. And I think some people in the industry's eyes have been opened. Uh, and I think it's important now that we continue to, to move forward and not allow ourselves to step, step backwards now into the old ways of working once, you know, world if and, and when COVID is not present return. So for me, it's all about now embracing those opportunities that are created by COVID. And, and learning from the challenges presented. And the challenges have been, we have had to embrace remote working and, and, and a digital strategy, um, maybe a lot quicker than some companies were prepared for. Hugo? Yeah, I mean, I, I just reiterate the point, really. It, it's accelerated the process that was already in place, but we did more of our business digitally. Um, but it hasn't had a significant effect on our day-to-day -day business. We're still trading 90% what we were doing before. I would just say that we've ended up using Lloyd's DPL a bit more proactively, um, and that underwriters generally have become better at dealing with things um, digitally. Simple as that. 
And finally, I'll come to you, Adrian, on this question. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, I think COVID's had a bigger impact on uh, digital transformation than any other initiative I've seen. And I think it's not just about uh, the great adoption of things like PPL. I think, you know, when I go around the market and talk to some of the chief execs, it's about their view now of the part that digital can play, the part that, you know, using data as a key driver for the business can play, whether that's helping with business growth or process efficiencies. Um, so I, I think it's really been helpful in getting uh, a lot of people in the market to truly think about uh, a digital agenda. Uh, and as I say, that's, that's way beyond just uh, using PPL more. And to that point, Adrian, I mean, do you think that um, because of COVID might help improve the adoption of some of the initiatives that were in Blueprint um, 1, such as Syndicate the Box, um, the Risk Exchange, yeah, I, some of these kind of cornerstones yeah. of, of, of Blueprint? I hope so. You know, Syndicate in the Box has made a good start. You know, Muni Cree were the first through, weren't they? And we've seen some others come through as well. Uh, I think the Lloyd Risk Exchange is very exciting, you know, taking low uh, complexity risks. And, and actually putting them on, onto a platform that makes it much easier to transact and, and also cheaper as well, which is very important because just the frictional costs in the market are still too high, particularly for a lot of the transactions that are lower value. So I think absolutely it plays to that agenda. But interestingly, you know, technology has been around and available in the markets for some years, but uh, adoption has been often the issue, uh, adoption or cultural uh, change that has often been a, a barrier. I'm hoping that uh, COVID will have changed the mindset a little bit and there'll be greater adoption uh, as a result as people see that, yes, you can work uh, remotely and digitally. Yeah, I think that's important. Paul? Yes, I mean, I, I'd echo uh, those comments from Adrian that fundamentally technology is an enabler. Um, it is actually about the behavioral uh, and the cultural change. Uh, and that is almost um, kind of aligned to the, the need to embrace technology. But it's not all about uh, the technology. And, and I think we must remember that um, the face-to-face -face still has a valuable role to play. And I think, to, to my mind and, and to our view here, we see we anticipate a blend where, you know, more complex, sophisticated risks will still require that degree of face-to-face -face interaction. But... To um, Adrian's point, the cost of transaction can be reduced through technology and digital, and it's about embracing that in a more scalable way. But I think in the higher volume play, then clearly technology as an enabler can add value to everybody in the value chain. But, but I think the key point for, for, for us, and certainly something I've learned over the years, is technology on its own, fine, but actually it's how it's in, enabled, deployed, and, and how the business gets the most out of it. Chris. Yeah, I think um, the syndicate in a box and risk exchange and the other, you know, sort of work streams within the, the Blueprint 1 for Lloyd's just sets the, the tone of, of what a culture at Lloyd's, you know, they are trying to build as an organization, which is one of, you know, the doors are open if you have a, a solid business plan with a, a you know an innovative idea that can bring new business to Lloyd's, that you know it gets away from that churn that's been an issue within the market, you know maybe having a business plan that is that is data driven is speaking to new data sources that give us you know more accurate and different viewpoints on risk. So I think it's great that culturally that is the message that you know we're open to innovation. I think. There are some other great work streams going on in Lloyd's that maybe don't get as much press as the future blueprint at Lloyd's. I think the you know the innovation panel at Lloyd's that's sort of led by Trevor Maynard and his team with their new launch of the two percent innovation risk code, I think is is another great um, a great outcome that Lloyd's has put into the market that will you know further encourage syndicates to to consider new new and innovative risks. So. For me, it's the, it's the cultural set that, yeah, we're open to, to modernize the way we do business. And I think, again, COVID will, will push that forward uh, even more so than, than it was um, before this crisis. Hugo? Yeah, I, I'm a maverick here a bit. I mean, basically, our business is face-to-face. -face, so we're able to operate with the underwriters who we know face-to-face, -face, but we're finding it much more difficult to operate with the underwriters who we haven't met before. 
So essentially what you're doing is you're focusing your business on your existing players. I mean, I did spend eight days in London the week before last, but basically most of my meetings were around the M25. So I basically was meeting underwriters and brokers around the M25 and doing four or five meetings a day in their home locations. But basically those are the same meetings I would have done in Lloyd's if Lloyd's had been open, um, which of course it is now, but most of the underwriters I want to see are not going to be in Lloyd's. So I can see that that system will continue for a bit. But the traditional method of doing our business is, is trading face-to-face. -face. And when we can't trade face-to-face, -face, we are less effective, and you can feel it. Um, and so, therefore, we will still stick with what we know, and we will simply adapt to it if COVID doesn't let us back into the system in time. As I said, the digital thing has been an advantage because we're able to force the underwriters to use PPL to process risks more carefully. But the actual negotiation process, whether it's Zoom or such like, it's still a face-to-face -face process and that's not going to go away. And whether the underwriter's in a box at Lloyd's or in a pub around the M25, it's not going to make much difference. But there will still be that process of the market because that's the way the market works. So can I ask you, Hugo, I mean, you, you mentioned there about the Lloyd's underwriter room. It did reopen at the start of the month. Um, I mean, what future do you see for it in, in the kind of, I suppose, short to medium term? And have you heard about you know, are, are people using it? Are people actually there um, to, to place risk? Well, the, big, the, the biggest problem at the moment, of course, is the increase in COVID test positives across Europe is reducing the amount of travel in between countries. So the, the, the six weeks before, I did six business trips around Europe. But now I'm restricted from Latvia because Latvia is closed down again because UK French numbers are all too high. So I can't dive across to UK now I, like I could four weeks ago. So assuming that that recovers itself, um, then we'll be back to the same situation as far as I can see. Um, but it's just a question. It's a short term thing now because the positive numbers are too high. But it hasn't changed our model. We until 10 days ago, two weeks ago, we were still doing exactly the same that we were in. And I know we had a, a slightly better base to work from, but we hadn't changed our model. Adrian. Yes, yeah, so I think it's interesting, isn't it? Well, uh, Actually, the underwriting floor uh, was a missed opportunity should it have opened at all. Uh, you know, the, uh, the stock exchange had its big bang in the late 80s, and it was an opportunity to hear to think differently. Perhaps it was a little too early, and, and the market wasn't ready for that yet. But mm -hmm. I certainly think it's going to be very different in the future. Uh, I think we'll, there will be a lower footprint going through the underwriting floor because people are used to, uh, to doing a mix now of working from home, and maybe they'll go into the office uh, or into the underwriting floor, you know, uh, on occasion rather than uh, be there all the time. So I, I think that will change, that that new, if you like, new normal will be different. Um, but I do wonder in the back of my right mind, was there an opportunity uh, to do a big bang? But, but perhaps there wasn't enough time and planning from March to September uh, to actually make that happen. Paul? I, I think, the, can I just add, that one thing I thought was interesting was this allocation of a class per day so I've been speaking to aviation underwriters, and there is a definite feeling that as the numbers reduce, they would basically be looking to make that a day when aviation underwriters are on the red Lloyd. So for me, traveling in to do aviation, it's very good to know that all the underwriters you want are going to be there on that day, because at the moment, it's a bit hit and miss whether they're there on the right day when you're there. So funnily enough, if that, if that comes out of it, that's very positive from a broker's perspective. Chris, I think you wanted to make a point. Yeah, I probably have a very different um, viewpoint than Hugo, but that might be I'm an underwriter and, and I have a different viewpoint to brokers. But certainly for me as an underwriter, I think it's been quite a profound and, and perhaps surprising change that I currently have much more communication with my brokers and my clients than I've ever had in my career. So I feel like the relationships I have with my clients are as strong as they've ever been. We've picked up new business. We've met new brokers, new clients. The face-to-face -face meetings will always be important, have their place in person, but it's been so much more efficient. I have so many more um, meetings and face-to-face -face interactions over a digital form of communication. So I foresee many more people keeping that regular contact with their clients overseas via video conference. You know, Pre-COVID, I, I could probably count on one hand, maybe at a push both hands, how many successful video conferences I had with US-based clients. Now I have three or four a day and pretty much every day. So 
is the requirement for me as an underwriter now to travel as much? Probably not, because I'm still getting that regular contact. Yes, I will have the need sometimes to do the in-contact face-to-face for, for larger clients, but it's definitely no longer the, the normal requirement. And, you know, I, I think that changes the number of days I need to be in the office, that I potentially need to be in Lloyd's. Uh, I can see most employees adopting a two to three days from home, if uh, potentially. So reducing the amount of square footage we would need as an office. Recruit, you know, reducing the number of boxes we potentially need if the underwriting room, you know, does, you know, change and, and, and continues. And I have some strong views on that, which I'm sure we'll touch on later. But, you know, you think about what impact that reduction in travel have, huge reduction in expenses, a massive benefit to the ESG footprint of insurance and, you know, and, and the clear environmental benefits. So I actually see a lot of positive, comp, uh, you know, consequence of this. And in terms of that broker underwriting model, I think it's going to be a hybrid of, of face-to-face and, and digital communication, and it can actually result in, in more contact than we've ever had with our brokers, which, which I think is a positive. Paul? Yes, I, I think I reiterate what I mentioned before. I, we definitely think it will be a blend. Um, in, in, in regard to the question of what's the new normal, I, I don't think any of us really have an, any idea, to be blunt. And uh, I think there are bigger issues that will influence whatever a new normal might look like. So I was kind of intrigued by Adrian's comment about uh, whether or not actually the underwriting room should have been opened in the first instance. And reflecting on that point, it kind of occurred to me that probably we weren't as an industry ready to take that step. But it would be interesting, wouldn't it, if uh, a harsh lockdown came back into place and whether or not actually with the progress that as an industry we made with the adaptability that actually that would give us a stronger position to then take the plunge. Um, notwithstanding that, uh, I am and back to, I think, and echo the comments of my fellow panellists. I firmly believe, we firmly believe that, that there is a blend that, that will materialise. But you know, what that means for each of us in the value chain, um, I think is still being worked out. Um, I think we also have to be cognizant of the talent that we want to retain in our industry and clearly bring into our industry. And I think that talent will also be looking for the um, approach around adaptability that I think as an industry we're beginning to now now, uh, take forward. So can I, can I ask you, Chris, um, to, just to pick on that point then, and as mentioned by Adrian, about, about a big bang in terms of, of the underwriting room. Do you yeah. think um, Lloyd's has missed, a, I won't we'll say the trip, but do you think Lloyd's has missed an opportunity here? Um, and, and, you know, I think Paul mentioned there about another you know, severe lockdown. Do you think if there wasn't a severe lockdown, it might give an opportunity to, to rethink and do something a bit more dramatic? I think it would have been equally dangerous to potentially make a, a knee-jerk reaction and, and sort of shut the underwriting room. That could have had unforeseen consequences on, on income and, and syndicate business plans if, we, if we'd if we gone that drastic. I certainly think Lloyd's needs to embrace, you know, or, or have a working panel to sort of say, which I, which I think they have, is the underwriting room fit for purpose and start that consultation. It is interesting to see John Neal recently interviewed and say, you know, in his words, I think, in his words, I think it's time to rip up the underwriting room and remove rigid boxes. I, I personally think that there is, there is a, a room for an underwriting room in Lloyd's. I just think that um, it needs a, a, a significant facelift. You know, so much risk now that we see is so complex. We have ability to pull data sources from so many different areas that give us new and, and different perspectives of risk that we can't ignore them as an industry if we want to you know, accurately price risk and, and keep delivering profits for our stakeholders. So I don't think for many industries, and, and it may be different by classes, but, but I do think the days are numbered where a broker can bring a submission to an underwriter at a box and a, and a firm decision can be made there. You know, increased levels of governance. Again, there's so much more actuarial resource required for, for complex risks. You know, we, we insure tech and a new share and economy business at Apollo. I pretty much don't write anything without an actuarial input. So for me to operate in a Lloyd's underwriting room environment, I would need it to be a more far more open, collaborative space where 
actuaries, brokers, underwriters, potentially compliance officers, claim officers are all adding into that process of what the solution needs to look like for this particular client, this particular risk. So I'm really excited about what Lloyds are going to try and build in the virtual underwriting room. I think that's really exciting. Um, will that be fit for purpose for all risks? Potentially not, because I think to Hugh's point, complex risks, you know, sometimes need that face-to-face in-person contact and discussion. But definitely I want to see the, the rigid boxes removed and, and a far more open collaborative space. That would be the perfect for me. But I think this consultation will be really interesting. I don't think a knee-jerk reaction is necessarily a, um, an opportunity missed. I think that's, you know, probably a sensible approach. Yep. Adrian? Yeah, I think it would be a shame if the underwriting floor, you know, over time returns to almost what it was, or, or even if it's a different line of business each day and remains at that level. I, I think it would be good to take the opportunity to say, well, okay, so in three or five years' time, what do we want it to be? And if we can get the Lloyd's Risk Exchange away for the low complexity items, uh, and maybe the underwriting floor remains just actually for the very highly complex risks. But to set out with, with that vision that that's what it's going to be, um, rather than it, it's reopened and it starts to try and get back to what it was before. So I, I think it is worth taking that opportunity to, to look at what that long-term future should be for the underwriting floor. Hugo? Um, yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're getting sort of split up. I mean, a complicated risk, if you take a complicated risk into an underwriter on the roof, a box, he simply says, well, thank you very much, Hugo, and then takes it away for two days and does exactly what he says you have to do, which is to sort of review it, uh, approve it at a higher level and go back. But an awful lot of the business that's still being happening in classes like aviation, marine, D&O, and so on, is still very instant decisions on a very basic level. I mean, aviation pricing is still a finger in the air because nobody knows what's going to happen the following year. So if they have a bad year, they stick the price up 30%. And if they have another bad year, they stick it up 30% again. But there's not an awful lot of science in it. And therefore, it's very much market driven by what people want on that particular day. And if you're not actually interacting to them face to face, you just miss out. Um, and, that's, and, that, and, and although we're sending it out on email and corresponding as well, it, we're still going to lose anybody who's still able to go to that underwriter and do it face to face. So th- there are different types of business in the market that need to be dealt with in a different way. Um, but I do accept that the more technical and complicated business was already being written in the office anyway. And so the whole process hasn't changed that. Finally, I'll come to you, Paul. Yeah, look, I, 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 I think that I don't see any diff- I don't have any difference of a of view to, to that position. I think um, I, again I reiterate I think it's a blend. Um, there has to be a focus around reducing cost in the transaction. Technology as an enabler can absolutely support that. There is absolutely a place for the face to face. and uh, that needs to be blended with the high volume, low transaction value. Um, but coming back to uh, the underwriting room position, um, it feels to me as if the door, if you excuse the pun, is already open and actually uh, change is on its way uh, and change will continue. And I think uh, the balance of that change to, to support all of the vested interests is the most important consideration as we go through this dynamic. So I just want to remind the listeners out there um, to put your questions through, and we have got some questions coming through, and, and I'll ask my first question now, because this question, I'll ask it to Paul, because Paul, you mentioned earlier about um, talent, and there's a question here from somebody um, from Lieber asking about the fact that, obviously, whilst we've seen e-trading volumes increase, this person has heard reports regarding the fact that there's a, a missing element of basically the spreading of information and knowledge to younger and less experienced people in the market while we've been kind of working at home. Obviously, the virtual room could be a, a way of addressing this, but do you think it's possible to fix that problem, the, the, the kind of, you know, the kind of spreading down and the cascade of knowledge to, to those who have not in the market as long? Uh, it, it, it's not a one fix, uh, not a silver bullet, of course. It, it's about having a range of um, policies in place that support uh, an overarching plan. 
but, but if we take the premise that actually as a generality um, the younger cohort uh, are more tech savvy uh, and more used to learning through digital platforms then the idea that we can uh, create and share knowledge through appropriate industry uh, learning platforms to me seems to be uh, an obvious way forward and a way of retaining and improving the talent as well as attracting the talent that we need as well and I'm sure you know across the various uh, kind of um, players that, that we have within the industry each organization uh, has its own specific strategy so if I if I think of here in Hyperion and our, our kind of focus around people first, a primary element of that is how we can support uh, our employees as they work from home, but also through the e-learning content and training and professional accreditation that's required. So again, I, to my mind, it's all part of that shift that I think is an inevitable shift, but each organization needs to work out how it now supports relative to its culture using technology as the enabler. Chris? Hello, is Chris on the call still? Oh, sorry, yes. Um, classic <laughs> COVID, you are on mute. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, I think um, I, I, I echo those comments in terms of, you know, there's, you know, the spreading of information, there's making sure the communication is, is high when you're working remotely. Um, you know, I, I, I see a lot of younger, you know, sort of people in the market are, whilst they are tech savvy and, di and digital savvy, they, they have a big concern with saying, am I, am I learning as much? Um, am I getting the same amount of experience by not being sat there within these face-to-face -face meetings or having the communication in the office as, as I once had? So I think it's important that within your organization you're aware of that and, and, and you sort of nurture and cultivate it. So with when you're doing meetings with clients, whether they, you know, they're virtual and, and Zoom or whatever they're on, it's making sure those junior people in your in your team and others that are going through the market have that exposure. They, they can join those meetings. and. There's an argument to say that with digital communications, you don't have the same constraints. You know, if I have a meeting in an office in London, I don't want to turn up with 12 different people because it just doesn't send the right message. It's typically me and, and maybe one other or two others. Now I've got the ability to have lots of people on that meeting, lots of people learning, lots of people involved in it. So you can create a more collaborative culture in it not to you know, slow down decision making, but you can have a lot more input because technology is allowing more people to be involved in the conversation. Um, so I think that, it, that, that is something that's an internal challenge for each individual company. And, and you know, people just have to embrace a, a new way of working. You go. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm two schools there. I mean, the Zoom has definitely allowed me to train more people at the same time and to include people that I wouldn't normally have included on meetings in said meetings. But basically, the, I've had two interns in the last four months. So what, I've got one Brit and one French person. The French person rather spoiled her copybook by arriving and testing positive. But, but putting that aside, and then I've got another Brit coming in January, and the two Brits have come to me because they can't get face-to-face -face internships in the UK. So essentially, we're actually teaching people face to face, and that's always been the best way. You can put an awful lot of stuff on the uh, on the Zoom or on the on the digital, but basically, unless somebody's sitting with me with a piece of paper saying, "How does that actually work, Hugo?" It doesn't. You don't train, um, and so temporarily, while London isn't working, there's no internships going on in London. Um, I seem to be attracting a higher quality of person at the moment, which is nice, <laughs> but I suspect it's temporary and it will return to another game in the future. Uh, and I know my eldest son is about to start accountancy, a um, new job in November, and he has to start on Zoom, which isn't much fun. So I think we've got a slight advantage being where we are and the fact that we can attract people because essentially that's the game. It's face-to-face, -face and people want that. Finally, Adrian. Yeah, I think uh, with young people, you know, particularly starting in the market <laughs> during COVID, it's, it's difficult. You know, myself, I joined WNS just three months ago, so I joined during COVID, and it is uh, a tougher 
start where you're not having some of the interaction you would normally do. You're not having the you know offside meetings uh, with people at the coffee machine or for a drink after work and that sort of thing. So it is tougher for them to get that information. Um, there are ways that you can fix some of that uh, with digital, but uh, I, I think they will always gain greater insights from having one-to-ones with people uh, and being mentored. Um, and I think that'll be important uh, as the market comes back as uh, we recover from COVID. So there's a, another question here from someone from um, Antares. Um, and basically, they make reference to the fact that, you know, increasingly surveys are coming out from different companies indicating people are, are happier and happier month by month to uh, work from home. And with this in mind, this person asks, I'll come to you on this, Adrian, first. Do you think the leaders of, of, of the London and Lloyd's companies are are strategizing about their businesses now with this in mind, or do you think there will be pressure applied to bring back more staff in the office post any second wave or heightened risk period? You know, that particularly kind of taps into Paul's comment earlier about, you know, digital strategies, and that it does probably now focus the mind on these digital strategies. I don't know what you think yeah. about that, Adrian. Yeah, I do. So a few things. Firstly, I think uh, you know, there would have been always some people who think that, well, if you're not in the office working, you're not working at all. Um, and I think COVID has helped people realize that working from home can be beneficial, but people actually still do work hard in that environment. But I think there's another aspect. I know a lot of single people who are working from home and they miss the interaction with others. But actually, you know, Monday to Friday, a lot of the interaction they had with other people was through work. And, and so you do have to think about, you know, what are, what are the impacts on people who live alone? Uh, are they going to be happy to work five days a week at home? Uh, and certainly from people I've spoken to, that's not necessarily the case. They'd love to have a mix of home working and in the office, but not to be uh, home working 100% of the time. Paul? Yeah, I 100% agree with that. Optionality, flexibility, I mean, clearly the digital infrastructure in place mustn't ignore the face-to-face. -face. We all recognize that has still uh, a, and will always have a really important value. Certainly, uh, to my mind, you know, thinking about the question, uh, leaders must have now a strategy that talks about how they can support their employees relative, you know, right for their culture, of course, but optionality and flexibility. Chris. Yeah. Similar for me, really. Um, flexibility, but it, you know, agile working does not mean working from home. Agile working means having the ability to work, you know, when and where you like, I suppose, and having a bit more freedom. I think sometimes, and this isn't just an, an insurance thing, but we potentially can be a little bit more guilty of it than, than other industries. For me, when I'm looking at my team or when I'm you know, managing staff and managing workloads, it's all about uh, output and not input. I don't care where you are or where you're doing your work. If you get your work done in the timeframes that, that I would like and our service levels are high and our reputation in the market is high as a result, I'm happy. And if you work better from home, great. If you work better in an office environment, great. But that office environment does not necessarily need to be the office that we have in EC3. Some days, maybe you go to a communal office like a we work type scenario or maybe you meet up with certain members of your team outside of ec3 and and you do work that way so uh, i think we've got to open our eyes to more than just work uh, in the office in london or work from home there, there's lots of other things you can do and we don't need to work to that nine till five there will always probably be trading hours within lloyd's but that also might be prime for disruption for me it's just cha let's change the cultural focus to outcome and uh, you know, output, not input. Finally, Hugo. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're repeating the same game, really. It's going to be a mixture of both sides. Um, and uh, yeah, essentially, it's become the, the digital has become a little bit easier because of things, but uh, it, it will go back to its own system at some point, I'm pretty sure. So, I mean, leading on to that, there's another question here from someone from Tolbert Underwriting. And again, this refers to the management of, of the businesses in the London and Lloyd's market. And they kind of ask whether you as a panel think that um, these execs will be brave enough to, to challenge and actually invest um, in, in, in the kind of uh, digital transformation, given that the current climate, it, it, there is some, some level of uncertainty there. Um, I'll come to you with that first of all, Hugo. 
so this is relating to the investment that might be needed um, for, to, 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 to kind of do that digital transformation. And I don't know where, where you come from on that. Well, I think we're too small to invest massively in digital, and, and I don't think it would make much difference, to be honest. Um, you know, when you're as small as us and you've only got 300 contracts, you know every single contract, and um, we, we basically take the view of being slightly overstaffed for it and operating on a lower cost basis than in London. Um, we've just taken a new team from another Lloyds broker, and in that case, they've decided to set up an office in um, Buckinghamshire and operate into London. So they were a team that was in London five days a week before, and now they're actually going to set an office up in their home county and maybe go into London one day a week. So I, I do think that more of that may start to apply. Adrian? Yeah, I think it's certainly far easier to make a business case when you've got size and scale. So I think always the larger uh, managing agents, you know, companies, market, and uh, and brokers will will get that through. I, I, I think he goes right that when you're smaller scale, smaller volumes, uh, what what's the business benefit you're going to gain from that? However, you have to also be careful that actually you don't fall behind um, and, and that you miss out on you know, certain pieces of, uh, of business. Uh, but certainly, I think size and scale matters, and particularly you know, a lot of the larger ones anyway will be doing acquisitions. And, and having a, a digital agenda can often help uh, integrate uh, a new company onto the existing platforms that you have. Paul? Um, the question made me smile because uh, it says to allocate big budgets. So uh, the individual at Talbot feels to me as if there's a bit of uh, positioning and negotiating needed to go on uh, within uh, that organization. Um, I think, in a sense, the creation of Hyperion X is probably a good good example of, of how we have thought about it. Uh, and I would state very clearly that you know, Hyperion has, is, and will continue to invest. Uh, we have a key strategy, a key component around digital and technology. Having a budget is one thing, of course, uh, deploying that budget uh, and being clear about what you're seeking to uh, deliver in terms of outcomes is a different matter altogether. Um, and and that, that does require uh, a lot of um, uh, persistence. Uh, and I have to say Hyperion has been fantastic in that regard. Chris? I think the investment is absolutely crucial for long-term success for, for me personally. Um, I think whilst there might be arguments for a business size, I, I, I do think it should be across the board. I think this is the way that our clients want us to react, uh, want us to interact with them more and more so. Um, I also think you get a lot more benefits than, than just being better at being able to you know, transact business. So if you look at today's expense ratios for you know, a, a syndicate at Lloyd's, you know, we have at Apollo our, our, you know, our aviation box and we have our marine box and then we have our liability box and our property box and our reinsurance box. Well, if the, if the long-term future of the underwriting room is going to be segregated days for each individual team, then why can't they all use the same box? So there could be huge amounts of cost reduction out of what we would pay for that physical infrastructure. And then you look at our own physical office if we're going to have a, a workforce that some days working from home and some days not working from the office, we don't need the same size office. We don't need the same number of desks. Um, you know, so there's huge reductions in that. You then look at people with traveling. Now, London wages have always been a reflection on how expensive it is to live in London, how expensive it is to travel to London. Can you start utilizing workforces in different areas of the country where salaries aren't as reflective of that? So embracing digital can create huge amounts of opportunities for cost saving in other areas. I think, you know, whilst it might be a big budget, you know, um, on the upfront, you know, the output, again, you can get from that investment can, can pay dividends in, in the future in terms of underlying profits. There's, there's no denying that the expense ratios within the Lloyd's market is very high. And I think embracing, embracing digital and investing correctly and smartly is, is, is what's going to bring about a, um, a quick sort of reduction in those expense ratios. Obviously, we've spoken a lot about um, kind of doing mean business in Lloyd's and um, London market, but we haven't really touched beyond the moment of truth um, claims yet. I kind of wondered, Chris, what, 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 what's been the mid to long-term impact 
on claims of the digitalisation. I know this is actually this is in Blueprint Blueprint One. Um, but I don't know what the kind of how claims have been handled during COVID and whether again there's any indicators of, of a future uh, a kind of more digital claims process. Certainly, I, I'm, I don't work specifically within claims, but I, I do have obviously a close touch to it being on the underwriting side. And there's been some quite interesting trends emerge. Um, I think, you know, claims handling will have to embrace digital solutions. They've had to during COVID. So, you know, you've seen the rise of virtual adjusting that was, that was starting to happen, but now again, accelerated because of COVID. There's quite a lot of interesting insurtech actually on the claim side, you know, things like mm. online arbitrations being used by companies to bring about quick resolutions of, of low claims matters that are just too costly to have, you know, a, a, a TPA involved or a lawyer involved. So I think that type of modernization was on its way, but has got bigger. I think you've also seen, you know, we're now operating in a very different, different world. Everything's uh, a lot more digital. Um, new companies have, have sort of emerged and, and have grown. So you've seen rapid growth in sort of delivery, delivery services and a huge change to e-commerce. Um, and they've brought about new emerging risks and, and they will bring different types of claims. So as an industry, are we prepared for those different types of claims and, and, and how that can affect claims handling? And, and then you've also seen a lot of companies have, have taken the approach, well, if you, if you do a lot in, in the US, and obviously the US is Lloyd's biggest market territory by grocery and premium, with lockdown measures, you know, when there's been certain cases that need to be tried in front of a jury, it's tough to see when that's going to happen. You know, because of COVID, people can't be together. You can't have groups of people. So, you know, it's really increased the tail of when those when those claims are going to come to a resolve. So you've seen actually a lot of companies trying to be proactive and say, you know, can we can bring about a quicker resolve to this claim because we don't want to be waiting three years to have our day in court. And, and some insurers have been able to use that to their benefit in, in closing off liabilities and closing off their tail um, for these claims where the opportunity otherwise wouldn't have presented itself. So I think there are opportunities to modernize the claims process and, and, and like I say, make sun, you know, make, make hay while the sun shines in, in what has been a difficult crisis for, for the claims process because that is such a face-to-face -face type interaction when it comes to mediations and things like that. A lot of that has always been a face-to-face, -face, um, a face-to-face -face process. You go. Yeah, I was. I'm really caught by that one. <laughs> you have to go back because I didn't because it's changed so much as a question on. You'd have to restate the question. Sorry. Yeah, no, you guys were just we were saying about basically the handling of claims and. I don't know what your experience has been COVID during COVID-19. Obviously, claims is mentioned in the blueprint. I'm just really wondering on your thoughts about whether there could be any kind of um, implications of COVID on the future of claims and probably handled in a more digital, remote kind of way. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, basically, <laughs> again, at our level, each claim is an individual case and still has to be handled in the same way. I don't think they could be handled digitally. I've never had a straightforward claim that can be handled that, that doesn't require face-to-face um, -face input almost. Um, so I, I just can't, I mean, I can see it through a big scheme where you're dealing with thousands of claims, but in our class of business where we're basically getting five to 10 claims a year, each one is an individual case and I can't see that changing. Okay, Adrian? Yeah, I think it depends on the complexity of the claim. I, I think if you remember back in 2017, AXA introduced FISI, which was their travel insurance policy. So if a plane lands late, you automatically get paid out. Um, actually, for that solution, they use blockchain, but you could solve it in other ways as well. So I think some of that automated uh, payment, claims payment, without you having to even do, you know, raise a claim will happen more or, or could happen more. Uh, we haven't seen too much of that, I think, but it, that's on a fairly simplistic level. I think we will see more uh, AI coming in, particularly around decision making against claims. But that's also dependent on doing the right uh, sort of data capture at the outset when the claim is made. So have you got enough uh, decision points to be able to use artificial intelligence to then say, yes, this claim is actually valid and, and we can pay that out. So I, I think technology can play a part um, across claims. Um, but there will always be some claims uh, that are so complex you absolutely need uh, that human intervention. Finally, I'll come to you, Paul. Uh, Jonathan, thanks. Yeah, uh, again, similar sentiment than my fellow panelists. Uh, look, there's already some innovation going on around claims, say, in the retail markets, for example. 
uh, some of that should surely fall into the way that we think about claims handling. Uh, and again, I, I would agree with um, the other guys, which is around the kind of uh, volume load transaction element and AI actually already proven in other markets, uh, being an enabler. More complex claims are still going to require that level of experience and expertise. So again, going right back to the beginning of the session today, feels to me as if there's a blend, but data technology, I think, can prove to be a beneficial enabler and actually reduce cost and create better outcomes for everybody in the value chain. Another, another obviously um, topic which is very much being discussed at the moment is around the, around the hardening market. And I just wondered, I'll come to you first, Mr. Paul. Do you think where everything's gone on um, since March 2020, how ready is the Lloyds in London market to take advantage of this expected to hardening market? I, I've heard people in the market talk about that other 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 markets like Bermuda seem to be be be, be, be more ready or kind of a better better p a position to take advantage of the hardening market. I don't know what your what your view on that is. Uh, I, I don't think it's necessarily got anything to do with digital um, or, or technology. Um, it feels to me it's fundamentally more about um, supply and demand. And uh, uh, our sense is that, um, you know, in a way, the market has been slightly behind here just because of that uh, kind of supply and demand and dynamic. Um, so... Uh, I, I think from, from our perspective, uh, we would see that um, slightly slightly behind the curve on this one, uh, Jonathan. Okay. Chris, you've got a more optimistic outlook? Um, I, I, I think uh, I can see what it's not driven by. The market conditions aren't driven by anything to do with digital and tech, but I definitely think that digital and tech is important when we look at market going forward in terms of you know at the moment we are in business planning processes um, as Lloyd syndicates with Lloyd's um, you know all syndicates I'm sure are excited about a, a hardening market uh, you know hardening market conditions we've seen evidence of significant rate increases across multiple lines within Lloyd's um, I think that will be set to continue um, certainly for next year and, and potentially even further beyond that in terms of you know Lloyd's and, and the and the and the growth that they're going to permit their syndicates to to to, to um you know to to achieve, I think will be based off how robust their business plans. And I think the the syndicates that can demonstrate, you know, that they do have you know that that digital culture within them that they're looking at risk differently, that they are trying to to use data in as much as they can in their underwriting to produce better results and, and perform to the plans they set out are ultimately going to be the the syndicates that successfully grow within that market. Um, you know, at, at Apollo with, a, with the SBA that we set up for our share and economy business, Lloyd's were, were incredibly supportive uh, and helped us set that up and, and, and have helped us with growing, the, you know, growing that business to, to a significant one. We're certainly excited about the growth opportunities in that market space because COVID has been somewhat of a, a great accelerator to the share and economy with, with growth in things like micro-mobility, on-demand delivery. So, you know, we're embracing those new risks, um, that growing business, and, and we think there's significant returns there. So, yes, I'm, I'm optimistic about the market. I think the, the people that will be successful is the people that can, can show a really robust business plan um, because they'll ultimately be the ones that are successful in raising the capital they need to, to take advantage. Hugo? Um I think the hard market obviously has nothing to do with COVID, really, but COVID simply hit it. I mean, the market had hardened well before COVID came along because we lost our shirts in 2017 and 2018. And as a, as a name at Lloyd, it's pretty obvious that if we lose 50 points, we've got to get it back. Um, and that's what happened 20 years ago and what happened um, sort of 14 years ago before that. So it's exactly the same cycle that happened in uh, 99, 2000, where it hardened before 2001. And then it went mad afterwards. And we had two very exciting years. At the moment, the hard market is accelerating um, and it's driven by lack of capacity and by underwriters sticking the prices up. And what's happening is that the leaders of the European companies or the big companies like AIG and Chubb are saying that's fantastic. So they're then putting pressure on their own underwriters to just copy Lloyd. So Lloyd is leading the way and I don't see it softening. I mean, COVID has basically meant that it's not going to soften 
as quickly as it might have done because there's still trouble to come. And I think it's going to be very good time 2021 and even into 2022. So that's what the market man says. <laughs> Adrian. Yeah, I think compared to the other topics that we've covered, uh, COVID and technology have less of an impact uh, in this. This is, a, as Hugo says, really normal business cycles happening. There will always be some degree of readjustment. You know, you get syndicates folding and moving into runoff. Uh, obviously, Lloyd's having written out to 18 syndicates not so long ago saying, you know, you need to improve your profitability. You know, lines of business get dropped and new ones get opened. And I just see that as uh, a natural cycle of events, uh, actually. I suppose uh, going to another question here, and um, somebody's asked really a question about um, London. I mean, I said it goes on, on, on it kind of moves on a bit from the question about the hardening market and the competition. But the question really is about is Lloyd's and London markets moving fast enough in terms of the adoption of technology to basically trailblaze in the global market space? I and mean, we've said that technology might not have an impact on, on this hardening market, but it, one in the future, you know, how how Lloyd's in London positions itself now could have an impact on that in terms of where it is in terms of the adoption of technology. I don't know if you have a view on that, Adrian. Yeah, I think it is uh, behind other industries uh, in that sense, but I think it's still well positioned to make a success of things. Obviously, uh, uh, Lloyd's in the whole of the uh, London markets from the insurance trade you know, perspective have a huge brand. Uh, and I think, you know, it's not too late. Um, and I think it's, it's worth adopting these technologies to, uh, to stay relevant. Um, and that's important. And actually what you see is, of course, a lot of insurance companies are able to put their business either you know, through the company's market or through their, their syndicates. And, and there's a danger, of course, if uh, in Lloyd's in particular, we don't become more efficient, that actually a lot of the business will shift more to the company's market and away from uh, from Lloyds and Bureau. So I do think uh, that needs to be looked at uh, and addressed where there's that choice. So yeah, technology can certainly help remain relevant. Paul? Yeah, so again, a similar sentiment. Uh, I think we are behind relative to uh, other sectors. Uh, I don't see any evidence at the moment that we're hugely behind um, in a number of respects. And it's still, of course, an incredibly vibrant market. But uh, if, and I go right back to the beginning, if you don't have a digital strategy, you need one because in order to be relevant in a really sizable way in five years' time, uh, we need to have uh, a higher level of digital activity than we do at the moment. Chris? Yeah, to, to Adrian's point, my my big concern as as a you know a solely operated Lloyd's business in Apollo is the fact that if growth can't be achieved within Lloyd's in a hardening market, dual platforms that have a company market will will take that growth and and then they will benefit on the company market, which will be, I think you know to the detriment of Lloyd's. I think Lloyd's have come out and said they want to see single digit you know premium increases for the market, um, whereas. Other company markets are projecting much bigger, um, you know, much bigger growth than that. And I, and I, and I obviously hope that this is a long cycle, but there is you know, certain theories that there could be a really rapid and short cycle. And, and what we don't want to do is, is that as, as a Lloyd's market, we miss that cycle and, and we grow, you know, when the, when the rates are coming back off again. So we want to sort of ride it up um, and, and, and really be prevalent and take advantage at, at the top of those rate increases. So, yeah, um, there is danger that we could that we could miss it, and, and the company market would benefit more than we can. But hopefully, that won't be the case. Uh, finally, I'll come to you, Hugo, on this. Um, yes, I would say that. Um, no, go on. Sorry. Um, Say it again, sorry, the, the first question again, because I, I had an answer, yeah, yeah. go on. That's right, no, it's really about the London market and basically maintaining its competitive, a competitive position, uh, yeah, particularly no, that, with the adoption the first of part. technology. And, yeah. yeah, the first part, I'd have to say that Lloyd's is miles ahead of the reinsurers in terms of digital transactions. So dealing with Swiss Re, Munich Re and all the other reinsurers we deal with, they're far less far forward than Lloyd's is. So Lloyd's is groundbreaking in that sense. But what we find is that Lloyd's compliance is so ungainly 
but it's pushing a lot of our business into company business because Lloyd's itself has become somewhat ungainly. And I think particularly selling exchange into America was a huge negative in terms of um, a lot of our funny countries around the world, which have become much more difficult to trade with because exchanging is putting up so many barriers because of the U.S. ownership. And on top of that, the compliance which has been put in is just making Lloyd's more bureaucratic. So we are shifting quite a lot of our business into company market during the hard cycle, not at cheaper prices, but more simply because the syndicates can't deal with the compliance issues. Then also, of course, they're short a bit of premium. So to a certain extent, they can shift some of that activity into the companies. But I do think Lloyd's has got a major problem with its sort of centralized bureaucracy and the cost of that and the unwieldiness of it. And I think they should just let the market players get on with it rather than trying to make it into a sort of big corporate giant. And my personal feeling is the market's always managed to do those things very well itself, and it doesn't need somebody else doing it. But that, that's definitely my feeling, is that we've moved business from Lloyd to companies because of the unwieldiness of it, not because of digital, not because of COVID, not because of anything else, but because it's become unwieldy. Okay. Um, we're about to run out of time, but I have, I have one final question. Uh, this comes from somebody at the IUA. Um, it's probably you can short answers here, but can I ask, um, who do you think is more wedded to face-to-face, -to -face, the broker or the underwriter? And I'll start with you, <laughs> Hugo. To say it again, who's more, who's more wedded to face-to-face, -to -face, the broker or the underwriter? Well, I don't, I don't think, you know, I don't think there's a special to that. The broker will do whatever's done to get the contract done. And if a contract's face to face, and the best way to do that is face to face, he'll do it. So whether the under, if the underwriter is more likely to do it face to face, then we as the broker will carry on doing face to face. Paul, uh, I don't think there is an answer. It's you know you do whatever you need to do using whatever you need to use, don't you? So uh, I, I don't think it's a, a, a yes or no Neither answer. Neither yeah. yeah, Chris. Oh, I definitely think it's a broker. I'm going to butt the trend here. Um, I, I hear a lot of I hear a lot of frustrations from my brokers saying that, and, and I get the comments quite a lot saying, "Oh, it's easy for underwriters to hide behind their computer screens when you know they're not in Lloyd's justifying the decisions they're making." And I think COVID has been hugely uh, has put a huge amount of pressure on on brokers, you know, to to rapidly transform the way that they do business and and the way that underwriters want to transact and have to transact and all the while being screamed and shouted at by their clients who still need their renewals done on time and in challenging periods where, you know, COVID might have made their insurance policy not very relevant anymore because it's had such an impact on their business. So I feel like when, when it does get to, you know, purely digital on the complex risk, there can be a feeling that a broker can feel like I can't have as much input as I would ordinarily have because I don't have that face-to-face -face contact that we're going to thrust through and get to a decision. So I, f I hear those frustrations from brokers regularly. We do our best to, to make sure that uh, that they, they're not true and that we, that we can really help them and we are responsive um, in a timely manner and we are justifying the decisions we're making. But for an underwriter now with, with increased governance, like I say, with increased data available, you know, we do have to have a lot more people, you know, have input into those decisions that we're making from a risk perspective. Um, and, and that is making the, you know, the quick decision making a little bit more difficult. But I still think, you know, from a Lloyd's perspective, you know, most syndicates empower their underwriters. And I think that's a real, um, a real blessing to our industry that we can have people make decisions. I just think it's a little harder when, it, when it's not face to face. So I would say, yeah, definitely the broker is more wedded to it. And certainly I hear those <laughs> frustrations a lot. <laughs> Finally, Adrian, I'll come to you. Yeah, thanks. I think if I answer this with a, an observation, if the underwriters didn't sit on the underwriting floor, they will automatically be less face-to-face. -face. And the broker and underwriter might meet in their respective offices, uh, etc., but that I think they would be less. So that's the way I'd answer <laughs> that, I think. Okay. Well, on that note, um, uh, we have run out of time, so I'd like to thank my panel of Hugo, Adrian, Paul, and Chris. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I'd also thank like you. to thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank you, the listeners, for uh, listening to this and um, posing your questions, and also thank our sponsor, uh, WNS. Uh, finally, just like to remind you about Insurance Post's online event, the Future of Insurance Work, which will be held on the 14th to 16th of October, uh, and you can go online now and sign up for sessions. But until the next webinar, it's a cheerio from me. Goodbye, everybody.